So welcome to our third grade Bible footstep. Uh, if you are currently in the third grade, go ahead and raise your hand. Excellent. Raising your hand on behalf of the child that stepped out. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. We are so glad that you all are here. You've probably been in Sunday school with us for a couple of years at this point. You maybe have had a Bible at your house. Uh, maybe you haven't had a Bible that is like just yours. Maybe you have like a Bible that your family shares. Or maybe you've had a Bible that's kind of like a, a story Bible, is what we might call it. So it has lots of short versions of the stories, maybe lots of pictures and things like that. And this is your first time to say, hey, this is my own Bible. That's the full Bible, right? It has every word in it, the same Bible that we read on Sunday mornings, and now the Bible that you have uh, right there in front of you on your tables. Um, and so it's going to have some special notes and things like that that are kind of intended for you as a younger person, as someone who's new to the Bible. It's going to have some special things for you there. But the same thing that you read in that Bible is going to be the same thing you hear on Sunday morning and the same thing you hear in Sunday school and the same thing you hear if you come to one of my uh, classes with your parents. All those places we're going to use that same Bible, and that's what we're digging into today, all right? Now, we uh, already prayed for our food, uh, but let's go ahead and pray for our time together, and then we'll dive right in, okay? Let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you so much uh, for the gift of these third graders who are with us today, who are um, taking this next step in their faith. We thank you for the gift of their parents and their uh, mentors who are here along with them, uh, giving them these scriptures and fulfilling their baptismal promises as well. We ask that you would uh, bless this time that we have together, help us to uh, listen well, to open our hearts, and to see all the new ways in which you will continue to speak into our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so first up, let's start here. Uh, what on earth is the Bible, right? Other than the fact that we've got this book um, that we look at uh, week after week and we hear stories from it all the time, and maybe you even know some of these stories from the Bible, what is this thing? Well, Bible literally uh, translates from a word in another language called Latin, and it means library. Um, so if you think of, if any of you know any Spanish, uh, you might know the Spanish word for library is biblioteca, right? Uh, the first sound of that is Bible, right, or Biblio. It sounds a lot like Bible. And so when we are talking about the Bible, we're literally talking about a library. We're talking about a, about a book that has a whole lot of other books inside of it. And so just like if you go to a library, you're going to find lots of different types of books, you're going to find lots of different things in the library, or in the, the library that is the Bible. You might find a poetry. You might find an adventure story. You might find a story with a dragon. You might find a story about history. All of those different things are going to be uh, stories that you might find in the Bible as well. So we are talking about a library full of different kinds of stories and full of different kinds of books. Ultimately, the Bible is all about revealing how God is at work in the world, right? This is one history or one understanding of looking at the world and saying this is where we see God this is how we see God interacting with us and with our families every day and every part of our lives. And that's the stories that we get to read, is how is God interacting with you and with me and with all the people who come before us and all the people who are coming after us. That's what we're looking for when we read the Bible. So we have two parts to the Bible, and we're going to kind of do this uh, class in these two different sessions. We're going to have the Old Testament. Old Testament covers over a thousand years of history. Right? So this would be like having a class that goes from the year 1000 all the way until now and having that all in one book. Right? That would be a lot, a lot of time to cover, a lot of history to cover. And the Bible is going to cover even more history than that. Um, it's going to have poetry in it. There's going to be a lot of laws. There are going to be parts that we call prophecy where it's kind of saying, hey, this is what God is saying is going to happen. If you keep doing this, God's telling you this is what's going to come. And so all of those things are going to take place in the Old Testament. That's mostly the first half of your Bible. Um, hey, Sarah, do we have an extra uh, Spark Bible around that I could uh, have by chance? Thank you. I'll, uh, you don't? Okay, I'm just going to walk off camera. Sorry for those of you at home. Yeah. All right, so if you're looking at the Bible right here, let's see if I can find it quickly. The New Old Testament takes up roughly Joel, Amos, Micah, Nittihom. There we go. This is the Old Testament, right? We say it's about half, but really it's way more than half, right? This is way, way more than half. A lot of the Bible is actually the Old Testament, the stories all leading up through the nation of Israel, all leading up until the time that Jesus was born. And then we get this little part that's in my hand now, and this part is what we call the New Testament. Um, testament is a word for promise or a word for covenant. And so this is the new promise, the new covenant that God makes with people. And this is all about Jesus. 
Um, so this is where we get stories like Christmas, and we get stories like when Jesus was a little uh, little boy and gets lost in the temple, and we get stories of Jesus feeding lots of people, and we have lots of letters from people to other people. We have stories of how the first believers in Jesus, how they walked around and how they lived and what they did. All of that takes place in the New Testament, all right? So those are our two major parts of the Bible. So we're going to dive in here and figure out first how many books are there. Now, does anybody else know because you're like, you've been studying ahead. You're like, I'm home, I'm quarantined, I got nothing else to do, so I studied for my third grade Bible class, and I'm ready to go. Does anybody know how many books are in the Bible? No? That's perfect. That means you get to learn new information. I love it. All right. So we've got two things we want to remember. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. All right. And so if you look at the word old, you have three letters in the word old, and you have nine letters in the word testament. If you put those right next to each other, don't add them or anything, just put them next to each other, you get 39. And that's how many books we have in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you have to multiply those. You guys know how to multiply? I don't know when you learned that. That's, no, maybe, <laughs> kind of iffy. That's all right. If you, if you multiply those together, three times nine this time, you get 27. And 27 is how many books we have in the New Testament. So all together, we have 66 total books. All right, so 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, 66 books all together. So there are 66 different books from cover to cover all in this Bible. Um, so we've got the Old Testament and the New Testament we talked about. From there we talked, it's divided into different books, right? So we get the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus. We'll cover others as we go forward, right? And then from there we divide into chapters. And from the chapters we divide into verses. This part's really important anytime you want to talk about the Bible with someone else. Because the books, the chapters, and the verses are an easy way for us to know, oh, that's where I can go to the Bible and find that verse. So on Sunday morning, if you hear Pastor Gary or myself or someone else <laughs> reading from a particular passage, we might say, as it says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verse 17. I don't actually know what it says in Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verse 17, but you know, as we say that, you can then go and look that up, and you'll know how to find it because we'll say those words every time. If we're writing it down, there's an easy way for us to look at it. It looks just like this. So in this case, John is the book, chapter 3, and then verse 16. So the book always comes first. The chapter is always right there in the middle, right before that colon. And then after the colon is the verse. And sometimes that's like 16-24, and that means you read all those verses through 24. Sometimes it's just one verse. But it's an easy, quick way for us to know, oh, that's where I'm supposed to go to look up this verse, where I'm supposed to go to find this information. So it's always book, chapter, verse. Can you say that with me real quick? Book, chapter, verse. One more time. Book, chapter, verse. There you go. So for all 66 books, it's exactly the same. Book, chapter, verse, every, every single time, okay? As we go through the class today, we're going to have some time to practice this and to look these things up in your Bible that are on your table, okay? So be ready, because we're going to have some time to practice this in a little bit. All right, so, Old Testament, let's dive right in here. I'm going to return, oh, we've got another one already. This is, I'm going to keep this Bible, take that. All right, Old Testament is divided into kind of four parts, and we're going to talk about each part quickly here. Uh, we have the first part, which is called the Torah, or the law, this is the very, very beginning of the Old Testament. Then we have the part that's called the histories, and then we have the writings, and then we have the prophets, all right? Now this sounds like a lot of information, but we're gonna move through it, and we're gonna give you a chance to kind of get a taste of what each of these parts of the Bible are like, okay? So we're gonna start with the law, or the Torah. Uh, the Torah is just a Hebrew word. Hebrew is the language that ancient Israel spoke, right? So the people who are in the Old Testament, they were speaking a different language than English. They're speaking a language called Hebrew. And they said the word Torah. It means law. And so the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. So go ahead and open your Bibles to the table of contents for me. The table of contents is pretty much at the front. In fact, it's on like, yeah, there's like a fake, thick, fake page here at the front, and that's like right behind that, right? Table of contents. So in here, <clears throat> excuse me, in your Bible, they refer to this as Pentateuch. That's another way to refer to it, Pentateuch. I call it Torah. Both are correct. Um, and it has the first five books, Genesis to Deuteronomy. You can see Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These are all part of the Torah. They're the first five books of the Bible. And these five books make up the foundation for every other story you read. Even when you're reading the New Testament, all of these stories take root, have their kind of basis 
in the stories of the Torah, in these first five books of the Bible. It would kind of like, or be like, let's see, I don't know, are you guys still into Harry Potter? Is that still a thing? Harry Potter was big for me. Is that still around? Okay, so imagine reading book seven of Harry Potter without ever reading book one of Harry Potter, right? That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. You'd be very confused. You'd be like, what is this wizarding thing? What's a muggle? I don't know what's happening here, right? You've got to read the first books first. And so that's where we start with our foundation, and we start with that in the Torah. So Genesis becomes like prehistory. Prehistory means it's before we even started writing stuff down. So in Genesis, we get stuff like creation, like the Adam and Eve story, like the Noah story of the flood, uh, Abraham and Sarah. Abraham takes his son Isaac, and, sa and God says, sacrifice your son Isaac. And Abraham's like, okay. And they walk up a mountain, right? Uh, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and Pharaoh. Joseph has that coat with lots and lots of different colors, and he ends up in Egypt and saves everybody. All of these great stories, they're all part of Genesis. You've probably heard a lot of stories from Genesis because there are great great stories that take place there. They're stories that are great for bedtime. They're stories that are great for afternoon reading. They're just great stories in Genesis. And then we get to Exodus, and people are in Israel now, and all of a sudden things aren't going so well, and uh, they're slaves in Egypt. And God says, okay, I, he I hear you. I see that you're slaves. I'm going to send someone to rescue you. And we get this whole story about this guy named Moses. And Moses is in the story for a long time. Moses is a big, important character. And in fact, for the rest of the Torah, Moses is going to be the main character. So for all of Exodus, all of Leviticus, all of Numbers, and all of Deuteronomy, Moses is the guy. And so you're going to hear stories about the plagues, hear stories of people crossing the Red Sea, and eventually in Exodus you're going to get the Ten Commandments as well. It's all taking place in this book of Exodus. From there we get Leviticus. Leviticus is like we're watching the movie and all of a sudden we press pause on the movie and we step out of the movie and we just say, okay, here's what you have to do to live as people who have been set free from slavery. And so it's a whole book about laws. There are lots and lots and lots of laws, but it's laws that God is giving to the people to say, look, you've never lived as free people before. You've always been slaves. I'm going to tell you how to live. I'm going to show you what this means. And that's what happens in the book of Leviticus. From there... We get into Numbers. In Numbers, the people are traveling through the wilderness again, so we're kind of wandering, 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 wondering where we're going. Uh, we begin this pattern that we're going to see throughout the Old Testament where the people screw up and God remains faithful. All right? People mess up, and God says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redeem you again. People mess up, okay, I'm going to do this again. And you're going to see this pattern happen over and over and over. And it's an important pattern for us to remember because guess what? How many of us make mistakes? Only your parents and I make mistakes? I don't believe you. Yeah, some of you make mistakes as well. We all make mistakes, and every time, with both hands, I love the enthusiasm, uh, we all make mistakes, and every time, God is creating a path for us to be restored, back to God, to make things right, to have things be the way they're supposed to be. It's a story we see in Scripture, and it's a story that God keeps playing out in our lives as well. And finally, we get to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is great, because uh, Deuteronomy is like Moses' farewell speech. Moses has been leading the people for a really long time, and Moses is about to die. And so he gets up on the side of the hill and says, listen, before I go, you all are going to listen to what I have to say. And then he talks for a really, really long time. And he essentially tells the people, you're going to mess up again. There's no doubt about it. Whatever you do, you're going to mess up again. But God is eventually going to restore you. God is eventually going to make everything right. And that's what happens to the Torah. This sets up everything else that we're going to talk about. The rest of the day all starts right here in this story of people being created, being called by God, being brought into a relationship with God, of us as people messing that relationship up, not doing the things that we're supposed to be doing, and God saying, all right, we're going to figure this out. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to make a way for you to be restored. And that's what we're going to get to in the New Testament eventually. But let's take a pause right there and let's look some stuff up, all right? So if you're on this half of the room, I want you to practice looking up Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You probably got the easiest one of the day. You're welcome. Yeah, really. If you're on this half of the room, you're going to look up Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. If you need help, look at your table of contents. Your table of contents... We'll give you a page number where that book starts. Remember, the book is the first thing you're looking for. So you can find the book, and then you can find the chapter, and then you can find the verse. Let's practice that all together. Again, looking for either Genesis 1-1 or Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. All right, Deuteronomy, folks, go ahead and keep looking that up. If you're still looking, that's great. But someone from Genesis, can I have a volunteer to read Genesis 1-1 for us? Nice and loud, as loud as you can so the whole room can hear you. Anybody feeling brave? Right over here. 
with a mouthful of pizza? <laughs> Your mom volunteered you, man. I'm sorry, I can't help you out on that one. Can you read Genesis 1 1 for us? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There it is. Very first words of the Bible. In the beginning. What a perfect place to start, right? It's a good thing that God didn't start out with, like, in the middle. And you'd be like, wait, what did I miss? <laughs> right? No, God says, in the beginning, this is what happened. This is how everything got started. All right, someone from Deuteronomy, you want to help us out? Yeah, right back here. Go ahead. Nice and loud. That was perfect. You shall love the God, Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I think it goes from on from there, but we're going to pause right there. That's perfect. This is actually a really, really important prayer for, or for the people of Israel and even for Jewish people today. It's a prayer called the Shema. Can you say that with me? Say Shema. Shema. There you go. It's an ancient, ancient prayer. Shema is a Hebrew word that means listen. And the first uh, thing that this prayer says is, listen, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. The Lord your God is one. And it says you're going to love the Lord your God with all of your head. Or sorry, with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. I got those in the wrong order, but you all know what you know what she said. It was you know it was there. The very very important prayer. Jesus is eventually going to quote this prayer as well. Okay, so these are some of the foundational texts, the, the foundational writings that start everything else that we're going to talk about. It all comes from this place. You guys are doing great. It was a great job of finding that book, chapter, and verse. We're going to have more chance to practice that here in a little bit. But now let's dive into our next section. Let's see, we did. We did tour already, so now it looks like we're on to histories. How many of you like history class? We got one whole table, all right? <laughs> we got a, a couple parents are in the All right, I get it. I was not a big history buff as a kid either. I get it, but there's some really cool history that we're going to learn about here. Is, history for the Bible is all about the story of Israel. It's the story of this nation of Israel. They enter the promised land, and enter this land. God says, I'm going to give you this land. This is going to be yours. All you have to do is live in covenant, live in relationship with me. That's all you have to do. Just live here and be that way. And they say, yeah, that sounds great. And then, right, they mess it up, like they do every time, because this is a predictable story. It's going to be an answer that happens a lot. And so eventually, they get thrown out into exile. It means they're taken out of their homeland. They're forced to live somewhere else for a while. And then eventually, God says, all right, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to give you another chance. And this is the story. This is the history that we get. And so these are the histories that we're going to be painting through all of these different books. There are a lot of books that are history books. A lot of books that kind of tell the story. It starts right after, uh, right after the Torah ends. So if you have that table of contents open, you can kind of follow along as we work through this. Um, we go right into Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First Kings, uh, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. Those are the big ones, right? Um, as we kind of walk through here, uh, Joshua is all about Israel coming into the Promised Land. So uh, Moses has died, and Joshua is going to lead the people. Uh, in Judges, we find out that you know what. Uh, you're going to see this pattern play out even just within this little book where Israel's going to mess up. God's going to lift up a leader that we call a judge. That leader's going to say, okay, let's follow God again. And the people are going to follow God and then they're going to do what? They're going to mess up again. And God's going to say, okay, let's lift up a new leader. And they lift up a new leader that's a new judge. And this pattern repeats itself. And so the people rejoice and then we repeat. Uh, first and second Samuel, we're going to get the first kings of Israel. You might remember stories about Saul and David. Maybe you've heard about David fighting a giant called Goliath. Um, and David eventually becomes one of the kings of Israel. But from the beginning, God says, all right, I'm going to warn you. If you have a king, guess what? You're going to mess up. You're not going to like having a king. And sure enough, they have a king and they mess up. And that's what happens. And so then we get all those stories about the kings who kind of mess up. And that's all through First and Second Kings. And so eventually, rather than one big kingdom, we have two kingdoms. We have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Um, kind of like if you've lived in the, or learned about the Civil War, we had a, a northern United States during the Civil War and a southern United States. They had that in Israel for uh, hundreds of years, well, hundred-ish years, a long time. A long time that they lived as two different kingdoms, and a lot of different kings came into that process. And so we get a lot of that, those stories of what happened to those different kings. First and Second Chronicles, then, is kind of like if you were reading about the Civil War from the perspective of whichever country you weren't a part of, right? So if you lived in the North and were reading about the Civil War from the perspective of the South or vice versa, that's kind of what First and Second Chronicles is. It's all the stories of First and Second Kings told from a different perspective, right? So it's kind of hearing those same stories over again. But you'll read that and you'll be like, wait, 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 I read this already. And yes, you did read that already. Not because it happened twice, but because it's the same story being told from two different viewpoints. So then we get up these other books. If you were looking along your list, you said, hey, Pastor David, you skipped some. What's going on? Why did you skip those books? That's no problem. We can help you out with that. There are these other books that we're kind of like, well, are they histories or are they not? Um, Ezra and Nehemiah, they're in the blue triangle because they are, in my opinion, definitely histories. I'd say, yeah, they're absolutely history books. 
and those are ones that count in this. Ruth and Esther were kind of like, well, maybe they're history books. Maybe they're just really great stories. Ultimately, to me, it doesn't matter if it's history or not. It matters that it's a great story that I can learn about God in, right? And so that's what we're ultimately going to be looking for, is how can we learn about God through these stories? Yeah, cool. In Spanish, the same word is used for history and story. Oh, in Spanish, the same word is used for history and story. Well, I'm going to have to go and sit on that. One. A true story that we know. I'm not going to be able to like sleep for weeks because I'm going to be thinking about that and what that means for us. But okay, yeah, so there you go. It's history or story, it's all, all the same as long as it's true. All right, I'm going to have to be pondering that, but I, I like that interpretation. Esther, interestingly, this is just a fun Bible fact for the moment. Esther is the only book in the Bible in which God's name is never used. They never reference God in the book of Esther. Read it sometime. It's a really cool story, uh, but they never use God's name in that book. All right. Did I go with that skip one? Nope, there we go. All right, from there, we're into, let's see, history. Ah, the writings. The writings are some of the most beautiful books that you will read in Scripture or potentially ever, anywhere, depending on your particular opinion. The writings are all sorts of poetry and songs and love stories and wisdom sayings, all sorts of really great stuff. Um, that's all counted in the writings. Um, so, some books that we include in this category. The book of Job. Job's a fantastic story where there's a guy and the devil goes to God and says, you know, this guy Job, he's not so impressive because he really only loves you because you give him all this stuff. And God's like, okay, well, let's see what happens when you take all that stuff away. And so it's the story of Job wrestling with the fact that all his stuff, all his family, all of his possessions, everything's been taken away. And he's struggling with, what do I do? And how do I love God in this situation? And what does God respond to that? It's a really, really cool story um, to check out. Psalms. You've probably heard us read Psalms on Sunday morning. Psalms are lots and lots of different songs. In fact, the word psalm, again in Hebrew, means song. And so these are meant to be sung. They're really beautiful. They're uh, kind of melodic. Sometimes even if you, it's just as you read it, you kind of find yourself naturally singing the words because they just kind of flow that way. Um, Proverbs, see, Proverbs is all sorts of uh, wisdom sayings, right? Things that we want you to be like, oh, yes, that sounds like I should remember that. That's something, you know, something your grandparents, grandparents would say, right? They'd be like, uh, I don't know, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, right? I have no idea what that means, but it's the kind of thing that would be in Proverbs, right? That's the kind of thing that would fit in there. Um, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, the Lamentations, all are other versions of the writing. Song of Solomon is a beautiful love story. When you're older, you can read that one or with your parents' permission. Uh, Lamentations is a story all about uh, people who are really, really sad. Uh, they're lamenting. Lamenting is another word for saying, I'm, I'm just sad, I'm brokenhearted. And they're trying to figure out how is God with us in the midst of our sadness. Uh, Lamentations can be a great one to read if you're feeling sad or if you're wondering where God is at um, while you're struggling with something that's really hard. All right, let's pause there. Let's take a minute to look some things up again. So if you're at these three tables right here, let's look up Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. If you're at these two tables right here, let's look up Psalm 100. You don't need to find all of it, just Psalm 100. And if you're at these tables over here, let's look up Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. All right, someone from our Joshua group, I see. Manuel has already taken his hit for the day, so congratulations, you're off the hook for this one. Marley, would you like to jump in and read Joshua for us? Thank you very much. Joshua 24, verse 15, nice and loud so we can all hear you. Now if you're willing, unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, wherever the God your ancestors served, and the religions beyond the river, or the God of the Amorites, and whose land you, you are living, but as for me and my whole household, we will serve the Lord. That was excellent, Marla. Thank you very much. And thank you for taking the hits on some of those really hard to say words like Amorites and other things like that. You're like, who are these people? An excellent question. Uh, yeah, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Right? These are people who are living in a new place, and Joshua is going to be their leader and says, look, you can do whatever you want, but me and my household, we're going to serve God. We've seen what God has done, and that's who we are going to serve. Uh, someone from Psalm 100, can you just read like the first verse of Psalm 100 for us? Roland, you got it? Go ahead, man. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. I love that. You know what that means? That means on Sunday mornings when you sing, you don't have to be on key. You just have to be joyful. Just make a joyful noise. Praise God. All right. Over here. What's one of the last ones? Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. 
I believe in you. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and God will make your path straight. Don't rely on your own wisdom, right? This is, this is the wisdom of Proverbs. Don't trust your own instincts. Trust God, all right? This is, what, this is what Proverbs is telling us, is rely on God's wisdom. God is going to make your paths straight. Um, there are some other really interesting Proverbs. I encourage you to go check it out sometime. There's one about people coming back to, uh, what is it? Like a dog to its vomit and a fool returns to its ways or something like that. Yeah, there's funny things in there. So check it out sometime. Uh, it's, it's entertaining reading and it's good stuff. For now, let's keep rolling right along here. We are into the last section, into the prophets. And we're going to just make it. All right, the prophet's job, imagine this in today's scenario. The prophet's, prophet's job is to challenge the people who are in charge and say, listen, you aren't doing things the way God wants you to do it. And so we need to shape up, we need to go back, we need to follow the way that God wants us to. And the prophets always bring these kinds of messages. They speak on behalf of God. They are warn at one point, they warn Israel, if you keep doing this, God's going to put you in exile. God's going to take you out of this promised land. That's what's going to happen if you don't change your ways. Guess what? Israel doesn't change their ways. And then eventually, when God brings them back, they say, okay, God was a part of this. God has been a part of this all along. God is still going to be a part of your life. God is still going to rescue you. The prophets serve all of these roles. The prophets were not powerful political people. Right? The prophets were outsiders generally. They generally came from out in the country or out from other places. And they would stand at the footsteps of the temple or the footsteps of whoever would listen. They'd stand in city streets sometimes. And they would just shout these things into the crowd until people would start listening to them. It would kind of be like if you can imagine someone who has no elected position whatsoever. But they just go and stand in front of the White House and start shouting at the White House. Hey! Do things different! God wants you to be better! Right? Imagine that. That would kind of be like what prophets are doing. They're standing outside yelling until people start listening. And that's how we get the stories of the prophets. So, in the prophets, we get these four books called the major prophets. The major prophets you can remember because they are Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Isaiah. I can't believe I forgot Isaiah. I forgot how to spell Jedi there for a minute. Um, you can remember them with the, with the mnemonic uh, Jedi, right? A Jedi just like from Star Wars because it's those four major prophets. Now, in, uh, in the Bible, you'll see that it's Isaiah first, but for the purpose of this demonstration, we'll just pretend that Isaiah is there at the end. So Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Isaiah. The only reason that they're major prophets is because they're long, right? They're considered major prophets because they're the longest books, and so they're kind of considered extra important that way. And then after that, you get a whole bunch of minor prophets. These minor prophets, we actually don't read them that often, which is kind of disappointing because there's lots of really cool stuff that's in there. So check them out. A lot of these books are pretty short. Um, there's some really great things that we can get from them. We get cool names like Habakkuk and Haggai and Nahum and Micah and Malachi. All these cool names come from the minor prophets. These are all people who God called and said, your job is to go and tell Israel, hey, you're getting it wrong. Shape up, right? Shape up so you can start doing it the way that you're supposed to be doing it. Those are all of the minor prophets. Let's see. Oh, we got time for one more. Excellent. All right, we're all going to do the same verse this time. Let's all look up uh, Micah. That's a good one. Let's all look up Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Micah chapter 6, verse 8 is going to be our collaborative effort to find this one here. Yeah, you ready? All right, go ahead. You got the next one, okay? Go right ahead. Nice and loud. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. There's a whole bunch of people here who are wondering, well, okay, this prophet's telling us that we're doing things wrong. Well, what are we supposed to do? And the prophet says, look, God has told you what to do. Love justice. Walk humbly with God. Show kindness. Be merciful, right? These are the things that the prophet calls out to us. So a really famous verse from the prophet Micah, that we can walk with God if we just love justice and walk humbly with our God. 
That's what God is calling us to do. Every time that we're messing up, every time that we're doing something that's not in line with what God wants us to do, it's usually because we're not doing those things. It's usually because we're not walking humbly with God, because we're not loving justice, etc., etc. et cetera. All right. Now, before we take our break, there are some other really important things that you need to know um, that exist either within your Bible or elsewhere in the world, okay? Um, these are some tips and things that you can use to help you learn more about the Bible. First is that online or sometimes in your parents' Bibles or other places like that, you'll have dictionaries and you'll have concordances. All right? A dictionary is what? What do you look to a dictionary for? Meanings of words, right? You say, I don't know what this word means. You look it up. Guess what? There are going to be lots of words in the Bible that you don't know what it means. There are lots of the words in the Bible that I don't know what they mean, and I look them up. That's why I have a dictionary right next to my desk, along with my Bible, because there I get to words, I'm like, huh, what does that mean? And so I start looking it up. So that's why we have a dictionary. A concordance will tell you where words occur in Scripture, right? So you might look and you say, I want to know uh, where I could read a, a passage about people who are sad. And so you'd look up sadness, and the concordance would say, oh, well, sadness occurs in Psalm 51, kind of. You know, or, you know, it'll tell you Psalm 23, look there for sadness, right? And it'll tell you where these words occur. That's what a concordance does. So it kind of goes along with the dictionary. An index is another great thing that you can look for. An index will tell you, like, oh, if you're looking for all the places where the Bible talks about um, feeding people, all the places where people are hungry and they get fed, the index will tell you where you can find all those different places. Or where does it tell me to love God? Um, it'll, tell me, it'll show you all those places where it tells you to love God. In the back of your Bible, you've got this whole section of pretty colored maps. Because guess what? The Bible did not take place in your backyard. Or my backyard, frankly. That's not where the stories are. And so we don't get it. We don't know where these stories are taking place. We don't know what these cities are that they're referencing. So they give you maps. And you can look on the maps and you can say, oh, well, when Paul was on his missionary, according to the book of Acts, you can look at this map here and you can say, oh, Paul went all around here. These are all the different places that Paul traveled. So as you're reading those stories, you can say, ah, now I get it. Now I understand why it was a day's journey to get from here to here because it, like, it's like 10 miles apart or something like that. Yeah? Are there maps that show names from those time periods versus today's names of places? I'm going to be honest, I haven't looked at every map on, in this particular Bible. Those maps do exist. Because I remember when I was a kid, I used yeah. to get confused because my Bible that I had at the time did not show that difference, and so sure. I thought those places were still places. So, on the first page of the map section, there is a, a small map that says uh, the Holy Land today, and it kind of breaks it out by today's uh, geography and today's countries and political designations. So that's kind of like your rough start, and then as you go through, you kind of have to piece that onto the other maps. So you kind of have to use some of your imagination, but your parents can help you with that as you're looking through this, because guess what? This isn't a project you have to do on your own. This is a project you all get to do together. And so if you look and you say, hey, mom, uh, where is Syria? And your mom might say, oh, well, the political nation of Syria is up here. And you're saying, yeah, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Bible Syria. And then they're like, oh, well, let's go look it up. And you can look it up together and see where those places are, okay? So maps are also in the back of your Bible. They're super helpful, and they're fun to look at. If you're into maps, they're a cool thing that you can check out. You can actually look and kind of trace with your finger where Jesus was walking and things like that. A couple other things to remember. You can find the Bible online. If you don't have this in your pocket, because it would be hard to carry this in your pocket, if you don't have this with you every moment of every day, you can find the Bible online. You can look it up. I like BibleGateway.com. That's just a personal preference, but you can use whatever, or whatever uh, Bible one you like. There are lots of different apps or devotionals that you can get. You can get it on your parents' phone, or if you have like a little kid's tablet or something like that, you can get an app on there, and it'll give you a little daily reminder of, hey, here's a Bible verse for you today, or here, here's a special prayer that you can use today. It'll do things like that to help you get into Bibles every day, because we want you to be reading the Bible as often as we can. TheBibleProject.com is another really great resource if you're new to the Bible. If you, even if you've been around the Bible for years, it's a really great resource, but especially if you're like, I don't... I don't know what this book about Genesis, I don't know what this is all about. Or man, I'm reading these stories from the book of Numbers and I just don't get it. What is happening in this story, right? By the way, I would not start your reading with the book of Numbers, just point of reference. But you're reading through and you're like, I just don't get it. What's going on? The Bible Project has lots of great short videos. They're usually five to seven minutes. They're really funny, they're animated, and they're great historical explanations of what's happening in these stories. They are smart enough. Um, that I use them in my classes with adults, but they are approachable enough that they can be watched by kids as young as like first and second grade. Yeah? Are they a Spanish version? I know that they are working on Spanish versions. I don't know if they're available yet. Uh, but I know that that's a project that they're working on, is translating that into a variety of different languages. All right. So, I made it. 
We're going to take a break. We're going to take five minutes.